Hello and welcome to the latest episode of the Retirement Cafe podcast, which is sponsored by my financial planner. Not knowing when you can afford to retire or what your pensions, investments and savings will provide can be worrying. My Financial Planner provides independent, fixed-fee retirement planning advice, bringing clarity to your financial future. At My Financial Planner, we build a financial plan for your retirement and equip you with the knowledge to implement the plan and buy any investments or products you need yourself. Find out more about getting a plan to fund the retirement that you really want and deserve at myfinancialplanner.co.uk. A couple of weeks ago, we shared the first in a series of podcasts designed to support and promote the agenda of the Longevity Week, which took place between the 9th and 13th of November. The title of this series is The Age of Resilience, which is the theme of this year's event. The Longevity Week is an initiative created by the Longevity Forum, whose co-founder, Professor Andrew J. Scott, was my guest on the 100th episode of the podcast, discussing his best-selling books, which include The 100-Year Life, The aim of the Longevity Week is to promote dialogue and test ideas on the future of longevity. So I'm delighted this week to share the second episode in this series with my guest, Patrick Thompson. Patrick works for the Centre of Aging Better and heads up the Age Friendly Employers Programme. His focus is upon addressing ageism in the workplace and supporting employers to become age friendly. Having held roles previously in government, Patrick is well placed to discuss the ageing agenda. So I hope you enjoy my conversation with Patrick Thompson. So welcome to the Retirement Cafe podcast, Patrick Thompson. Hello, thank you. Well, Patrick, I've been really looking forward to our conversation. Now, I know a little bit about you, but um, our listeners may not. Now, you work for the, uh, the Purpose of Centre for Ageing Better. Um, tell, tell me, tell me about the purpose of Centre for Aging Better. What do they do? What do you do? It's a, it's a fair question. Uh, so the, the Centre for Aging Better, uh, we're a charity. We were set up about five years ago, um, and we're all about supporting as many people as possible to have a good later life. So we we know, and I'm sure you know through your podcast, you know we are all living uh, older on average, but the ways that we're we're doing that haven't quite caught up. So. The Centre for Aging Better is all about working with employers to improve work. It's about working with house builders to improve the homes we live in. It's about supporting better communities and supporting people in better health as they age. Um, And we really focus and hone in right down on the evidence, see what works and try and spread best practice there as well. Mm. So, yeah, we all, I mean, obviously we're all getting older, as you, as you, as you mentioned, Um, and your job title is Senior Programme Manager for Filling Work. I mean that's pretty grand. Um, <laughs> well, well, what, what, tell, me, tell me what you're doing. What, what is that all about? Sure, and I definitely don't want to don't want to get ahead of myself with with the job title. But um, what that means in effect is one of our big aims at the centre is to improve work opportunities for people in their fifties and sixties. So, so we talk about fulfilling work, but that can mean right. a lot of different things. It could mean you know, people being in better work for longer. Um, and, and essentially, I, I uh, manage our program looking at that, and that might involve things like commissioning new research where we, where we see gaps in it, or it's working with employers and recruiters and running pilots to see how things can be done better. And ultimately, that's to improve things for the employer, but really, really importantly, improve people uh, things for the individual as well, so that as people are approaching their, their later life and retirement, their experience of work isn't disadvantaged. So do you think there's, um, I don't know, what's the, what's the perception from employers at the moment? I mean, do they want to employ older workers? Do they just want youngsters? What, 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 what's your view? It's an interesting question. We, we've been, we talk to employers a lot all the time about this. And, and age, as I'm, as I'm sure you, you and your listeners know, it's a, it's a protected characteristic. So it's one of those things under the Equality Act that is, is, is protected. And yet, unlike a lot of the other protective characteristics, it isn't really thought of in the same way. And I suppose it's because aging is something that's happening to all of us. People don't often recognize themselves as aging. And, and, and also people's attitudes to what is old age is very different depending on their own personal san- circumstances, their work history, their outlook and things like that. Um, so, so at the moment, if I'm being completely honest, most employers probably aren't thinking about this a great deal. But 
they're probably missing something there because this is one of the things that every single workplace know is happening to their workforce. We, we know the population is getting older and we also know that the, the workforce is getting older on average. And with a little bit of planning and foresight, employers can be making huge dividends on this as well. Because if you know, for instance, that your average age of the workforce used to be in your 30s, it's now in its 40s and 50s, you could be changing and tweaking things within the workplace to support those people to be in better work for longer, to help support intergenerational teams working together. And also for people who might be approaching retirement, you can help them so that they might be able to work for a bit longer and, and stay with, with you as an employer for a bit longer as well. So it, I think we we still got a way to go, but I think some employers are starting to catch up on it now. Yeah, yeah. And this is not just about kind of menial work, is it? I mean, the, 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 there's, there's opportunities you know, when I when I talk to to my retired clients, you know, they've got a wealth of experience, and often they end up in the charitable sectors, or they do some voluntary work, or they do, you know, or they do consultancy. Um, but there is, is this is not just the job at B and Q, is it? You know, pushing the trolleys. It, it, it certainly isn't, and there there isn't anything wrong with that as well. And we and we, I mean, from our research looking at this, I mean, the, the first thing to say is there's this huge wealth of differences between people as they approach later to life. So if you think of one in three workers are over the age of fifty, that encompasses so many different experiences, so many different skills level, incomes level, so many different past histories there. So the first thing to say is you can't really typecast anyone in this age group too much there. Some people are absolutely thriving at work, are, have got huge amounts of opportunities, are doing exactly what they want or, or transferring into a different career that really suits them. Other people really are, are missing out and that, and that might be based on a, a range of things to do with their personal, personal circumstances, but also to do with sometimes employer behavior as well. And we see that, for instance, in things like um, opportunities for recruitment and progression we often see those are can be age biased and people in their 50s 60s and, and older miss out in the workplace yeah and i think um as an employer myself i suppose that i think that the, there are there are different things that a older workforce would bring to the to the table comparable to youngsters i mean obviously that the age of experience um you know maybe even kind of part-time work and flexible type work that people are using to enhance their pension income you know maybe they haven't managed to amass as much as they hoped and but they and they still feel that they can be um definitely part of something i think that's a really a good way of looking at it because um i think the way that we used to think about work a generation or two ago where it was work was one solid block and often you might work for one employer your whole life um you might work up until a certain age and then just stop and then that is retirement and, and you have a bit of a cliff edge there. I think that model has gone. And I think probably if it could be managed well, it's a good thing that that's going away because people are people don't stop working because they, they hate work. It's often because they hate that one job they're doing. They hate one aspect of it. Often people do want to keep on going on in work. And often if you can do it in a flexible way, if you can flex down towards retirement, you can be working and earning for, for longer but it doesn't have to be a full-time thing. Um, we've done a, a project recently working with um, an organization called TimeWise, and it was all about how you promote and um, manage better flexible working. And that could be for larger or small employers, but ultimately that is the one thing that can help people to work for longer um, and be in better work as well. Yeah, yeah. So, I mean, if I, if I gave you um, a magic wand... <laughs> And that you could change the kind of perception of older workers or or the opportunities available to for older workers. What would you do? Well, yes, yeah, it's, it's a really good question. We've, I mean, in some ways, we've 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 waved the magic wand already. We've changed something. So, for instance, we've changed the law about um, uh, you know who can work and not. So, a decade ago, I was working in government, and we we removed the default retirement age. So previously. Um, employers could effectively retire someone at, at 65 um, and not have to give too much of a reason for it. We've moved on from that, but but actually that that one wasn't quite as magic because we're still seeing age discrimination in the workplace. So I, I think probably if there was one thing, it would be that people are not judged on their age, um, whether they're young or old, but people don't have stereotypes about people because of their age in the workplace, because we know a lot of the things that people might have a stereotype about it simply doesn't bear out in the evidence. So we know that um, older workers are 
actually less likely to have short-term sickness absence. Um, they do want to continue to progress and learn new things as well. Um, they, they, are, they do add to productivity in the workplace. So there's a whole range of things that, that you know, employers and others might think about older workers that don't really stack up at all in the evidence. So I was going to uh, wave a magic wand. It would probably be to remove some of those stereotypes in the workplace. Yeah, yeah. And I think, you know, that as we've got an ageing population, that means all we've also got aging consumers, haven't we? So, so the people are buying the products and the goods and services. Um, you know, I often think, you know, the, the classic line of if you want to understand someone's problem, you should need to walk in their, in their shoes. Um, and therefore, you know, if you are 70 and you're on a call center and someone's struggling with the possibly, I don't know, buying his car insurance from the internet and you're sat there and you've had the right training and you're going, do you know what? I get it. I understand that you're struggling with this, but I can guide you through it. You know, whereas possibly maybe a 20 year old may not have that life experience and be kind of going, what, what do you mean? You don't know where to click, you know, <laughs> it's, isn't it obvious? And of course we're coming at it from different perspectives. Of course, a 70 year old is going to look at that as a different perspective than a, than a 20 year old. Yes, I think the the employers who have taken the lead in this, I think it's where they've seen the business opportunity for it. So they're either in a working in a field that really understands the aging demographic, and, and in that way, they're kind of one step ahead of it. So, um, yeah, you're right. I think the, the employers that are, are doing things on this see the, see the benefit of it to them. I think the one thing I wouldn't want to get too much into is the idea that you are better or worse at doing your job purely based on your age. And I think that's also true of, of, of younger people as well. Um, but you're right. I think people, employers, particularly when you ask them in surveys, what do you value about older workers? It is things around experience. It's around know-how. It's having done the job before. Um, and often we, when we look at studies of productivity as well, it's, it's not so much the productivity of that individual worker, but it is what they bring to the wider team as well. And often it's their transfer of knowledge. It's the it's the calmness in doing things. It's the interpersonal skills and, and conflict resolution that can be really, really valuable to employers. Yeah, yeah. And and can you, I mean, I don't know whether you can do this, but are, have you got examples of employers who you're kind of looking at and going, you know, wow, it's really, that's really cool what they're doing? Uh, yes, well, I mean, we've been working with employers for, for a number of years here. I mean, the the example, I think you said it in the intro there, was, was um, you know, people always sort of being cute as being and this this is an example from you know uh, 20 plus years ago um where they really they made a point of saying we are going to to celebrate the, the experience and and know-how of um the older workforce and, and really put them front and center in our shops um i think there are a number of other employers now who are doing good things as well so for instance we we work with a, a lot of employers who are doing good things on their their carers policies other ones who are doing fantastic things on outreach and recruitment and really seeing um, people at different life stages being a really, you know, great source of talent for them um, who might want to work part-time or who are working in the, in the, in the uh, caring professions is what I'm thinking of there. Um, so yeah, there's, there are a number, number of employers doing a, doing a really good job there, but I, I still think probably your average employer has got some way to catch up still. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So, um, the other thing I wanted to touch on is you you, you had a background with um, the London 2012 Organising Committee, um, Workforce and Recruitment. Tell, tell me about your experience in that. Yes, yeah, so yeah, in, in many ways, not too related to what I'm doing now. Um, it was a, yeah, a fantastic job, a secondment from, from government where I was working previously. Um, probably the one bit where it does probably play across to here is we... London 2012 was fantastic in terms of diversity and inclusion. I mean, it was, it was something that really had it right at the heart of the organisation, um, and it and it had it across all different characteristics. It was a very outward-looking and you know internationally focused event. Um, the one thing I do you know I do dwell on is even though we had age as a as a factor in that, it was overwhelmingly about thinking about youth and young people and, and kind of a celebration of um, uh, youth there, and actually not quite so much on 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 age as well. And I also think that was, again, it was a, a brilliant place to work. It was a very high tempo, often, you know, a long hour culture. And I was reflecting now on my, my current work. I think that would be a very um, difficult job to do for a long, long time. So I think if, 
if we think of some of those things that make work more difficult to do for longer, I think that kind of work environment could actually be one where it is more difficult to, to work for longer. And we, and it, and it really matters because this is from UK data. Um, it shows that one in four people don't think they could do their job or a job like it over the age of 60. And I really think back to that time at London 2012, and I thought I loved it at the time, but I don't think I could have done that job into my 60s and beyond because it's such a, um, you know, such a physically exerting thing. If you're if you're running events, doing doing long hours, those are the things that can catch up with you a little bit. But having said that, yeah, fantastic thing and learning a huge amount about how workforces are managed, how mass recruitment exercises are done, um, and how to make those things more inclusive and fair as well. Yeah. Yeah. And you mentioned a minute ago um, about that you work, work for government. And I think you were a member of the government social research group unit um, where you were managing projects for the DWP ageing society strategy. So, you know, obviously from just even that statement, the government's taking this seriously. DWP is taking this seriously. You know, there, there's a there's a there's a thought process, which is great to hear. Um, there's a thought process into our raging society. Tell me more about what was going on there and, and, and what, you, what you liked and maybe what you didn't. Yes, yeah, sure. Um, I mean, this has always been, it's always been an important topic for, for, for government. If you think of, you know, spending coming out of the, the Treasury, um, the ageing population is one of the things that, that we can plan and, and see into the future, and we know is going to have huge, huge impacts on, on the economy and society. So government has always been interested in it, but it's always been a very difficult thing to, to um, kind of weave together a strategic plan for how you do that. And so I work for the Department for Work and Pensions. They took a focus on it because obviously there is the, the pensions aspect of the aging population, but it was then wanting to, you know, interact with other departments. So making sure that the business department was interested in this as well, making sure the treasury was in, in, interested in it as well, Making sure the Department of Health was interested, but not only from a from a kind of a sickness and ill health perspective, but also from a preventative uh, perspective. So, government was interested in it, but the, the problem was that all these things around demographic change they are long, long uh, processes, and it is always tempting to think this someone in the future can sort this out. Someone in the future can sort this out. Until actually, it, it comes to the age where where you know it does become a real issue that, that too many people are leaving the workforce before they might want to. Um, you know, the people aren't properly supported in work for longer as well. We see government has pulled big levers in making changes, for instance, increasing the state pension age for both men and women. And I mean, now just the, the other month, we've seen that rise to 66 for, for, for everyone. And it is, will be going up to 67 as well. So it's, it's those big, big changes the government make that suddenly individuals realize that I've got to do something different about that. But the, the planning that people need to take, they need to take it a long way out. So actually, we we really focus on thinking on actually people in midlife in your in your 40s and 50s. That is really crucial time to be making some decisions about your future career, your your health, and your your finances as well. And actually, you could be better supported to do that. Um, and the, the one other thing I just mentioned on what was fascinating working there, we did a lot of really um, in depth uh, social research at the time. Really interesting things around attitudes to age, when do different uh, people think that old age begins, when does it end, um, people's attitudes to people of different ages, and actually it was, it was fascinating to see that, and a bit sad really, that there was actually very little mixing between different age groups, but where there was more intergenerational working, so much the better, and then also things around who retires and when, and how, how unequal that can be often, because it's the, the people who most need to work for longer, because they have the fewest savings, or they're the most financially precarious position they most need to but they're least able to because of health conditions or racism in the workplace so a fascinating place to work and i think in a lot of ways the center for aging better has been the organization to take on the mantle particularly looking at the evidence there because we're very fortunate in having a a 10-year endowment so we're funded to to look at these these issues in the longer term um, but then also think about how you can make practical change there as well yeah yeah absolutely what um what impact do you think uh, COVID has had on kind of, you know, workplace for the older worker? I mean, uh, I, I suspect it might have been pretty, pretty tough. I mean, it's a, it's a massive uh, topic at the moment. It affects, you know, every aspect of, uh, of life uh, and, the, and this as well. So 
I'd say overall it has been fairly mixed. It has definitely had a you know devastating impact on some people. You think of the the impact on health, the need to shield, the the people being typecast and put into vulnerable groups um, and needing to isolate, particularly that has had a really you know a very big impact on on uh, people's home and work life. Um, we know from some research we've done for the the Institute for Fiscal Studies that one in eight people over the age of fifty have changed their retirement plans as a direct result of COVID-19. That's both bringing retirement forward and you know, retiring earlier um, or pushing retirement back because they've seen their pension savings hit and their savings hit and they, they know that they need to work for longer. Um, but having said that, sometimes it's, it's positive. So you know, people have suddenly realized if they've got a job, they can work from home. They're not having to travel long distances. That actually makes work feel more sustainable and that can have good aspects as well. And you, and you you suddenly realise actually I might be able to do this job for another five or ten years, and it and it might suit me quite well. So, so I think it's definitely a mixed picture there. I think that the big thing we're really seeing is the you know the impact of the economic downturn on on job losses. We we can see from the analysis that that has particularly hit the younger stage of the the job market. So so particularly uh, you know workers under the age of twenty five, they're in sectors that have really been hit there, and and as they're leaving education as well. But the other end that has really, really been hit badly is um, is old workers in particular. So people in their late 50s, 60s, and, and um, you know 70s as well have been hit both in terms of the, the number of people on the furlough scheme, people who've been forced into early retirement, or people who've had to, to, to um, take up benefits as well. So it's both ends of the age spectrum have been hit by COVID. And, and we really we haven't really seen the even the beginning of it yet. I think it, it's going to be quite a complex picture for uh, for years to come now, I think. Yeah, yeah. And it's, um, you know, uh, it, it's obviously a very small sample um, that I have access to. But the, the, the people I the people I work with are generally retired, uh, though they have taken up when I say they're retired, they're retired from their main job. And a lot of the what I again, it's a judgment, of course, but what I view when I view a lot of the successful retirements and people who seem to be quite fulfilled and full of energy and passion, etc., are doing some kind of work in some shape or form. Um, and you're right in saying that maybe their work up until the moment of their retirement wasn't absolutely fulfilling, but they've now because they have possibly the choice, they have really found fulfilling roles in the community and, and in society something that they really enjoy getting up for. I think you've, you've hit the nail on the head there when, when talking about choice. And we see this from, from all the, the research and evidence that where you have choice and control about how and when you work, that's incredibly good for your, for your well-being and your sustainability to work for longer. Um, and also, you know, important to remember that we talk about work, but often a lot of the things that look a lot like work and they've got great, you know, economic and social value, they're not paid, paid as well. So, you know, if people are, are volunteering, are giving back to the communities, are caring for others as well, and that is an activity that that looks an awful lot like work, but you just you just happen to not be paid for it. Um, but the cho the choice and control is really important. I, mean, I was fascinated looking at this, and again, this was back in um, when I was um, working in government in the social research unit. There, we looked around people's retirement decision making and how and when they worked, and the fascinating thing there was even people who didn't get the retirement outcome they wanted. So actually, they might have. Um, retired earlier than they, they would have liked to. But if the experience of that happening was a good one and the, the employer was supportive of them, they were able to have a good send off at work, that was a thing that really carried through into their retirement as well. So it's, I suppose it's your, your last day at work is really, really important. And if you have a, uh, you know, a, um, a handshake, a send off, you know, a, a really good experience of, of going out there, that's fantastic. If you've been forced out early if you've um, had a health condition that's meant you you've exited and not really had to have proper closure at the workplace that is that those things stay with people well into to later life as well and the final and this is my kind of my favorite stat at the moment is we also know that one in four people do return to some form of paid work having retired so and I like the way you talked about retired from their from their main job um, it's no longer a one-way street so people are returning to work and it's either because They've realized they've, they've slightly misjudged their finances, they need to work for longer to, to make ends meet, or they realize that they miss all those things at work that you that are beyond money as well. You know, we, we know that people really value the social aspects of work, the meaning and purpose that they get from it as well, and that is often where people are returning, and, and often it's in a different kind of role from what they were doing before. Yeah, 
Yeah. And I think, I suppose, that, that having some kind of plan for your retirement, have some kind of view that what is it that you're going to do, um, what's the role that you're going to have, um, whether that's a paid role or it's a volunteer role or what have you, but but, but make sure that it's... Make sure that you know you're not just drifting into retirement. That you're actually you know you're you're take, you're attacking it with some discipline and kind of having a strategy. I, I think that's that's absolutely right. And it, and I think the more that you can keep your options open, and and I mean sometimes those those options are kept open by you know by saving more by by retiring later. That gives you more choice and control about how that happens as well. But I think yeah, it is really crucial to have a plan about not just your finances, but how you want to spend that time. Um, and it might be a phased retirement and you, you do it in different ways. But um, we've seen, and this is, it plays out in the evidence as well, that where you have a cliff edge retirement is fantastic for a week, two weeks, three weeks, a long holiday. And then suddenly people realize, what, what am I doing? You know, all the connections that they had from work are suddenly gone. All the, you know, people suddenly realize they did have a lot of friendships and social connections at work. And it's not quite the same unless I have a plan for how I'm going to spend my time in retirement as well. So, yeah, important to have a have a plan and think about, uh, you know, your your home life and those around you as well who might need caring caring for in the future. You know, partners, relatives, other people as well. Thinking about them as part of your your plan as well is really important. Yeah. Yeah, fantastic. Wise words. Thank you, Patrick. I've really enjoyed our conversation this afternoon. I really appreciate you spending the time uh, chatting to me. Where can people find out more about you and the Centre for Aging Better? Well, really, everything is available on our website. I mean, we are on a social media platforms as well, but if you look at aging-better.org.uk, everything is there. And, you know, as a charity and, and people who publish research, everything we find we, we we're there to share it with the world so we we want to get the message out there and, and everything is available there for free on our website marvelous brilliant thank you very much thank you so until next time this is justin king helping you feel more informed in your retirement